Positioning yourself as the coach can be a massive game changer in your ability to help someone overcome life-altering pain issues. But how do we do this? What steps do we need to take? In this week's episode of the Modern Pain Podcast, I sat down with Matilda Kaler, and we discussed this transition. Matilda is providing amazing education that is helping physios make this transition. We talked about the disconnect we have with some of the things we want to focus on as physios and the challenges people face in their lives. There was a problem. It was just like, it doesn't add up. How does this actually help the person. It's not their goal, it's my goal. It doesn't make sense that we should figure out how two millimeters of stability around the pelvis is gonna help you live your life better or make meaning for you. For me, it took shelving my ego and the need to be the fixer that got me off the burnout train and really helped me better connect with and help people in pain. We spoke to the real expert in our encounters. But the person in front of you is actually the expert. So this mindset shift, where we don't fix and we actually really listen with authentic interest and human connection. Really just listen to the person in front of us and make them come in the driving seat and make them the main character. We discussed the issues people in pain face when they travel through a healthcare system that continues to focus on pathologizing them. They have all these other systems that are getting error after error and I mean, Understandably, a lot of the folks that come and enter our worlds are wrought with the thought they are so full of errors and so broken and so fragile and so frail because we have these systems that do nothing to, to tap into the resources of the person. They just, if anything, drain the resources because these people stop pursuing the resources they have because they feel like they're so defeated and broken. If you are struggling to make a transition from the fixer mentality to the guide or coach, this episode is for you. One favor I ask you, that is, if you get value out of this podcast, you consider writing a review or subscribing wherever you listen or watch the podcast. Now, on to the episode. This is the Modern Pain Podcast with Mark Cargilla. Matilda, welcome to the podcast. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you and I have crossed paths a bit on social media. Like minds obviously join each other a little bit on social media. I've always enjoyed your content and yeah. Uh, Sometimes it's not in English, so I have to, I've had to use the translate function a little bit on social, but it's been great stuff. And I've been fortunate to chat with you a little bit as you've been planning some big things over there in Denmark. But for those of the folks in the audience that don't know you, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit about where you're at, where, what you're up to, and maybe a little bit about your journey? First of all, I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and it's amazing. I love to hear it and hear all the great guests you have in and so it's a very privilege to be here so thank you well my main name is uh, Matilda and I'm from Denmark and uh, I've been a physio for like a little bit over 10 years and my journey well it started actually from contemporary dance I was a dancer before I was a physio and have this great experience that you can dance six to eight hours a day and the body is amazing and it can do all kinds of stuff and I always have this experience with me that it's just like it's amazing what the body can do. But then, of course, like most <laughs> people who do sports for a, the, on a high level, well, I got an injury in my knee. So I went to a physio, right? I was, at one point, I was both amazed of what he could do and what he could figure out about my knee just by touching it and moving it. I was just like, wow, can you do that? So I was amazed about all this figuring out how the body works. And then, but I was also like, he had no idea how to make sport specific rehabilitation for a dancer. So I did all like, the lunges and squats and things like that. It was very football kind of stuff. So actually my way into physio was that I wanted to be a dance physio. So I went all the way through the sports physio world and very detail oriented and was a sports dance physio in Denmark for a while and only worked with the ballet dancers and contemporary dancers and all that kind of stuff. But actually, at the same time, I also started on pain education and especially the musculoskeletal way. I have a diploma in musculoskeletal therapy. And, and the more I learned about pain, the more I kind of discovered I need to learn about people. It was also because the pain, even though the diagnosis was quite the same in two different people, the persons were different and what they wanted to do if they were a dancer or it was, I don't know, Greta on 35 who was just going to go to the garden. We needed different things and how it impacted the person was very different. So even though the diagnosis was the same, it was very different. How can I help this person? Uh, and the more I learned about more complex and chronic pain, well, then the 
psychologically informed physio and the communication skills. And uh, back then it was really like a pain neuroscience education that was quite high at that point. Uh, and all this, how can we educate and help them understand the pain more? So my world shifted a bit from all the pain science to all of the psychology. So like, for instance, it was coaching that I mostly uh, took my degree in and then act, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, compassion, all these kind of, because they all had this way of methods that was helping the person. But the problem was I had the pain signs in one hand and then I had all these psychologically informed methods and theories, but none of them talked about the person in pain. And it was just like, they all talked about other kind of stuff. And I was just like, how can I mix these two? How, how, I need an education that mixes all the things I know from here, but all the cases, all the examples, they were not about pain. And I was just like, we need to get the pain science and this psychologically informed methods and theories and questions into the pain world. And that's actually where I am today. And that's why I'm here and why we cross paths because I now have trying to create a pain coach education in Denmark. It's always interesting, the similar journeys that you know, people I take as far as people that have gotten into persistent pain, as far as recognizing a lot of the shortcomings maybe of our education that we have in physio and, and different things. I'm wondering where, like, what have been the major shifts? You, you mentioned them a bit as far as some of the things you, and especially when you had your physio, who was more of a football-based physio, and, and then you wanted to be the dance physio where it's going to be athletics and it's going to be dance, high-level performers. What were the major shifts for you? Were there any particular moments or anything of where, man, this just doesn't work the way I thought it worked? Where, what were those moments for you? Because I think we all had those I think I'm just going to identify the pain. And I'm like you said, with a, your physio who was figuring things out in your knee. And of course, there's a time and place where we can do physical exam to identify some structural things. But I'm wondering what those kind of challenging moments were for you as you were coming up, uh, where you were recognizing maybe the traditional way we were trained in physio wasn't meeting the mark when it came to our patients in pain. When I think back and when you talked, it was just like, oh, there was many. I come from this dance world, this belly, and we just, it was small movements, like tiny movements that made the difference, right? We stood there and like really specified about this. And then there was all the, at that time in Denmark, it's called dynamic stability. It's all Paul Hodges stability and micro <laughs> management, <laughs> you would say about the muscles. And I've been there like with a laser pointer, figuring out how the pelvis is going to move like two millimeters in a sideline turnout. And I was just like, this doesn't make sense. How is this millimeter stability training around the pelvis and the, uh, the core? <laughs> How is that even going to relate to what you're going to do afterwards? So definitely there, there was a problem. I was just like, it doesn't add up. How does this actually help the person? It's not their goal. It's my goal. It doesn't make sense that we should figure out how two millimeters of stability around the pelvis is going to help you live your life better or make meaning for you. So that was definitely one of them. And I think also we went through all this, we went from this, this biomechanical and point of view where we've tried to figure out how can we make a specific diagnosis? Because when I thought as a young physio that if I made the specific diagnosis, then I could give the specific intervention. And the problem was, the more we learned about all these tests and more and more information and research came out, it was just like, okay, we can't make specific diagnosis. And most of the time, it's non-specific. So what is the intervention? So I was just like, it, was, it got more and more complex about what is the right thing to do here? And is the diagnosis important enough to make the intervention? So it's, it was, I thought it was really a complex time and I still think it is quite a complex time to be a physio, but it's also a very exciting time. I think it's a very exciting time to be a physio right now because now the science tells us with restore trial, with the walk back trial, fit for perfect purpose, all these kind of stuff makes it like the intervention is getting broader and it's it not necessarily more the biomechanical stuff that's 
not that important. <laughs> that's a big discussion. I'm not going to go into that. But that's like bigger podcasts in itself. But but the intervention is getting broader and that's more personalized. And that's so exciting. I think it's really exciting how to, we can do the intervention in collaboration with the patient. So you've inform me that your title of your handle is the pain guide and that's what it translates to from danish to english and it, it goes speaks to what the transition i think you and i both agree we need to make as physios is, is serving as the guide not this hero of the story where we have to swoop in and, and become the the person that finds the issue and fixes the issue where we we hold that change as a badge of honor here as physios i'm i'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit of your kind of development as a coach and how you feel like that, because you, you mentioned you've taken a lot of education as coaching as a coaching education. I, I'm wondering if you can speak to that as far as where that education has served you well when you've brought that to a physiotherapy kind of treatment strategy. The coaching is three things, I would say. First of all, it's a mindset. And it's definitely the mindset shift from the expert kind of view to the more collaboration and person-centered kind of view. So the mindset shift about believing that the person you sit in front is actually the expert in their lives. They are the expert in their pain, and they are actually the ones who know most about their pain. So this mindset shift about not us being the expert, but we have, of course, the expertise and the knowledge about pain and people and behavior change and the interventions that we recommend today. But the person in front of you is actually the expert. So this mindset shift where we don't fix and we actually really listen with authentic interest and human connection, really just listen to the person in front of us and make them come in the driving seat and make them the main character in this treatment plan. That's definitely a big shift. And then there is the second part, which is the skill set. In coaching, we have this saying that coaching is the art of asking the right questions. And, and to ask the right questions, you need to listen. So the best coaches I know and the best coaches I've watched, they actually don't talk very much. <laughs> they actually really listen carefully and very interested and curious like they're really curious about the person's story and how they experience it how it's affecting their lives and then they ask these almost beautiful questions like you were just like you like blow your mind kind of questions where you're just like you can see the person is making the reflections that make them shift about wow i haven't seen it that way or yeah i can see now so we actually help them on the journey and is this kind of, yeah, guide. That's why it's the name, not the, I'm not the expert. It's very important for me, but it, I'm really the guide trying to listen carefully and then trying to ask questions and help them come to their own like epiphanies and, oh yeah, then I can do this or creativity. Just like, oh, maybe I could look at it like this way. Ah, oh, okay. So really like help them on their journey. So it's more like help them through a process with pain. And then, of course, the first, third thing is the knowledge. So you need to have a knowledge about pain science, of course. So really understand the complexity and the biopsychosocial view of it, but also knowledge about psychology and human behavior. Because the thing you want to do is not just talk to the person. You want to help them make a change in behavior. And that is so important that you have this, first of all, mindset about them in the driving seat. Then you have the skill set of asking questions that help them change behavior that serves them better in their life, that is more meaningful to them, that make them come closer to their meaningful goal. So yeah, that's three things I think about coaching. So it's not just talking. <laughs> it's not just rewriting, reconceptualizing the problem, but it's also behavior change that's so and so important. I love how you speak to, because I think we've all had this struggle. I know I definitely had it as I was trying to develop into this type of role because I spent a lot of my encounters prior to really practicing in this manner, 
where I was doing most of the talking. And I, we have students in clinic. We just had a patient where a couple times a week, we have students from our university who will come and we mentor them, which I'm fortunate. I love that part of my job, but they were like, you barely talked at all. Like they talked like, and cause they were getting uncomfortable, right? Cause they're thinking, I got to ask these questions. I got to ask these questions. I got to get through my, the, the, and again, we still asked the right questions about red flag screening and all the things like that, but they were surprised how much the patient talked and how little I talked throughout that education. Did you find it hard? I know for me personally, I felt it almost a little bit of a difficult transition. And I don't know, maybe it's an ego thing as we have as, as physios is it, it almost puts us in this consideration that maybe we're not the, I don't know, want to say main event or maybe the hero, but it's a redef redefinition of our worth in the encounter. And to me, it's a much greater worth in the encounter when you can take somebody and coach them and help them find change within themselves and talk them through it. But it's a difficult transition. Did you find yourself struggling to go from that, like how we're trained in physio, where we really lead the encounter and we're really asking all these questions? And we know we have so many stories, even these on the podcast, where patient after patient we've interviewed, it said oftentimes they didn't feel like anybody listened or let them tell their story. Did you find that a, a difficult transition for you? Yes, absolutely. First of all, because there's also this, what is a physio if we don't do manual therapy? What is a physio if we don't prescribe exercises? Is you a, are you a good physio if you don't do that? Because that's how we're schooled. We're schooled to find the error and fix it. That, that's how I was trained, right? And it was just like, I had a, actually, it's a funny story. I had this, she wasn't a student, I was a student in the physio. And she, she dropped out of physio and started on what's in Denmark calls a, a psychomotoric therapist. So it's like, and we talked afterwards when she did the shift and she was just like, it's amazing. Physios, all they do is look for errors. That's all you do. That's how we train. We look for errors. And where things were a little bit wrong, everybody who's a physio student knows how to stand in their underwear with and get measured, right? So we remember this, that we needed to find the error and the tiniest kind of thing that would explain the problem. And that was all we did at the at school. And then she was just like, in my, in my education, all we look for is resources. Where's all the resources in this person? It was just like, it was so amazing for me to have this conversation because it was just like, ah, and actually I think I did that shift afterwards, but it took me a couple of more years before I got there, but now it's finding the resources in the person, actually see the person and believing they actually have the resources if they're allowed to unfold or explore their resources. And that's how we can help them, right? Be believing in, I, I believe your body is adaptable. You have a biology like anybody else, of course. You have this hope. Sometimes I think a coach or a guide is someone who's holding the light uh, until they, they are able or have the confidence to believe they can hold the, the light uh, for themselves, right? So we just help them have this knowledge about the body being adaptable and the plasticity of all the, uh, of the body and the mind. I think yeah. uh, you spoke to the transition. It's interesting the people we cross paths with to, to make that shift where, you know, and I love the discussion of error finding, right? And it seems our patients come in with list after list of all the errors and not just physios too, as they, as they venture into the medical system, there's all these things. And there's a lot of our patients with chronic persistent pain, they have chronic overlapping pain conditions, migraines, they have GI dis dysfunction, they have all these other systems that are getting error after error. And I mean, understandably, a lot of the folks that come and enter our worlds are wrought with the thought they are so full of errors and so broken and so fragile and so frail because we have these systems that do nothing to, to tap into the resources of the person. They just, if anything, drain the resources because these people stop pursuing the resources they have because they feel like they're so defeated and broken and, and error ridden. I'm wondering if you can go over a little bit about what kind of a session of a pain coach like uh, looks like. You discuss some of the nice things of like, there's always these discussions of, well, you're only just talking to somebody. You're not doing any, you know, of this traditional physio stuff. I think you've nicely pointed out that we still do those things. It's just... We need to move past it. And I, I did a post about a little bit of the criticism of us getting excited about the latest passive way to <clears throat> short-term modulate pain. And then people say, well, you're saying it's never done. I'm like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can do it. And then you great. Choose whichever one makes the patient feel better temporarily. But now what are we doing to get the patient to make change that's meaningful in their life? But coming back to your, your the coaching sessions, I'm wondering if you can discuss what it looks like to have a coaching session with somebody who's dealing with some painful issues. 
I think that the most important part, if I'm meeting a person, a new client, I have the luxury of making my own clinic. So I have two hours for the first patient. And that's, and I know that's a huge problem. It's again and again, that's the thing. How can I do this? I know I'm going to, there's so many clinicians who want to do this, but they're just like, the system doesn't work for me. I have half an hour. I have all these expectations. I have to do all this. How can I do this in a short time? So, and I truly believe you can do a lot in very short time. There's a very, a, a lot you can do and learn about communication skills and learn about relationships and how to build a bond and how to, and maybe also what not to do in a half an hour. But most of all, I think you need to listen to the story. So I love Peter O'Sullivan's quote, which is, tell me your story, right? You just open it up. Just come on. I got the time. I got ears. I really want to, and really have this curious mind, really like, I want to get to know you. I want to understand you. So I had this, so, so yeah, okay. Oh, there's so much I want to say, Mark. It's so exciting. Okay, well, let's take one thing at a time. So the initial assessment, I had this, I was on a webinar actually on Monday, where they quoted that we should make a shift from what's the matter with you to what matters to you. And I think that's quite beautiful because it's just like, it's not about me figuring out what's wrong with you, but it's about what matters to you. What is the problem? What is your story? How did you get here? And where do you want to go? And actually, before we figure out anything about what's wrong with you, and of course, there's the red flags and all that. It's not for this podcast, I think, it, but of course, there's a physical examination if there is something you need to exclude or figure out. But right now, I think we talk more about the coaching session, right? So we need to figure out what's important to this person before we start making an intervention or before we start you know, like, like shooting questions, <laughs> like this machine gun kind of stuff. I was on a clinic where I did some teaching in, in pain coaching and communication. And I had this, this guy and he was amazing. He knew all about this new modern pain science. And he was so informed, like he was really skilled in the knowledge set. And then I put them together like two and two and make them have this more like this initial assessment about try not to figure out what's wrong, but try to explore the pain. Like we want to explore it. What is this? And what is this? And how about that? Like really exploring. And what and he was together with a girl, with a woman who was about, I don't know, 45 and had some headaches. And he and he his first question was. Well, after he listened to a story, it was like, okay, so when you turn your head like this, does it hurt? And it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. I was just like, oh, okay, biomechanical kind of question. Okay, fine. I was listening, right? And he, then he did like this. Okay, you said you was running. Well, when you run, do you, does it hurt when you like have these bumps in your... Uh, and then he asked about, well, uh, how, how far are you 45? Right? How far are you like in menopause or is the... And all the, he was trying to like finding the question. He had all the knowledge, but he was still schooled communication wise in finding what was wrong. And, f and not necessarily, sometimes I think it's so important to figure out what is it you want to do before we figure out what's wrong. What is it you cannot do right now that the pain stops you from? So we find the goal before we go into what's wrong. Because then we figure out what the goal is, and then we can figure out what is standing in the way of doing that. And that's a different approach to how we go into to the uh, first or initial assessment. So we're really trying to figure out the goal. The goal is absolutely one of the most important parts of, of, of a coaching session to figuring out what is it that matters to you and how do you get there. And not just to figure out what the goal is, but also because when you get when you ask people about what their goal is, what value it will give them if they achieve this goal, and why is it important for you to get there, we also connect with who they are as a person, what their motivation is. And we also, it's often like if you ask somebody about their goal, they tell you what's prohibiting them from doing it. So, so you, you, it's actually the process of goal setting. It's much more important actually then the, quite the result of the, the goal setting. Of course, you want to you know exactly what the goal is, but also the process about getting to know them, 
figuring out what is it you want to do and what's stopping you from doing that. Because then you get all these like, ah, oh, okay, then I need to get this about pain signs. Okay, maybe I need that. Ah, okay, then I need to get yeah. So we get so much information about asking what people want to do afterwards. So that's if I only like try to keep it short about the initial assessments, that would be my absolutely main goal. You put into words kind of something that I've been trying to encapsulate myself as far as like starting with what matters, which <clears throat> I think we have this tendency as physios to really try to break down the micro, right? To the, like you mentioned with the Paul Hodges and Paul, I think would be the first to admit that that's no longer maybe how he practices with that thing, but he, you know, been tied to the core thing. Cause he did some research that made us think back when, and obviously our thinking is, has moved since then, but I'm always thankful to, to those initial folks who bring out some things that of course research then challenges, but it, we have this tendency to, to break things down to the micro of like, your gait patterns, like you said, the physio there was like, what's happening in your running mechanics, what's happening in your cervical spine. <clears throat> and again, I don't think that's wrong, but I think if we flip the script and really look big picture, what is what makes you tick? What gets you out of bed? What makes you want? What is pain getting in the way of that's meaningful and matters to you in life? And then bring it back to where what are the things? And it might get to the point where, hey, there's maybe some local nociceptive issues in the neck that we might be able to do some local symptom modification things, of course, positioned as a guide, as a supporting thing, not some sort of curative fixative thing. But I, I like how you state that because I do completely agree. I think that's the, the best way to practice is with folks is to really, and I don't think this is something that's unique to somebody who's got persistent pain either. I think this is something where people, whether it's an acute ankle sprain or it, just knowing what makes you tick as a person, then you tailor your communication to really try to pull into that and push position what you're doing to let's get you back to the things that matter for you. For some people, it'll be the things that we're used to it. And they want to get back to sports or they want to get back to things. But for some, I think if we just don't ask and we just miss a huge opportunity to really, one, get a, an establishment of a therapeutic alliance and rapport with somebody who really hears that you're listening and you understand what are the things that are most important to them. Have you found this approach really, because uh, I know for me, it's been like big game changer with like patients who give you the slack as maybe an early career clinician, or maybe you don't have it figured out yet, right? And again, I, we're not trying to figure it out like we have to have the answer in the thing that's going to do it. But I, I think people, when you when they hear that you are listening, that you are somebody that is on their side, that really understands what makes them tick, that they are willing to make a journey with you that might make some missteps here and there when you try things or you do things that may not always work as perfectly as you, as we'd like it to. Have you found that really opening some doors where you can be creative in session, but also have the room to maybe try some things that may or may not go well in session? How's that been for you? First of all, I absolutely agree that that it's the relation before the information or the physical assessment, but it's not like I don't want it to be. I'm not advocating for just talking. Not at all. I think we as a physio has a central role in helping people with pain. And I think our hands is amazing. And what we can guide people through movements, we can, when we make the physical examination, it's also about reassurance. So telling them what we do and telling them what we're figuring out and telling them maybe most importantly of all what we are not finding. And that's quite important, I think, especially when we talk about this, all this kind of error finding stuff, right? When we tell them, all the things that we didn't find and really help them. Not, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Bye-bye. Not that kind of style. But really this, I can see that you were worried about this. Let's check it out. Let's figure it out. And then talk them through it. Take them with you as you move their body and or move their joints or whatever it is. And then concluding this, okay, we... I. Uh, with all that I know and with all the testing we can know, I'm not worried about your body parts, for instance, and so your joint. There's nothing here that worries me, but that's not the same as I can see that your pain is really uh, a problem for you. And I would love to help you. And we have all these kind of interventions and we want to guide you through that. So we don't go into, sometimes I feel as a physio, I've been there myself and I know a lot of the, the physios I work with. They also, they want to give a diagnosis, right? And we need the communicational skills to be comfortable 
and confident in not giving uh, a specific diagnosis, but still reassure the patient that we can help them. And that's actually, I think, a, a, quite a big shift also to feel okay and have the skills to take the patients to, well, we can do all this and this, and that's interventions that can help you with your pain. And I'm Let's figure it out. And we know what more when we start the interventions, what's working for you. If we think of ACT and really clarifying values with somebody, which I think is a huge exercise to get front and center early in our working with somebody so we can really understand what makes them tick, what is the things that are meaningful mm. to them. Because if we can position our care of those are the things that are meaningful for us to work on, I think one, patients are like, yeah, that's the me I want to be that I'm struggling with. And then we can identify, well, what are the barriers to getting there? And then we can sometimes move ourselves down to a little bit more of the traditional things. Like we're going to get people moving. We might do some exercise. Again, if you do some symptom modification stuff that supports as long as, again, the patients, we position mm. it well. And it's not becoming something that the patient thinks is some curative measure, but it's something to help them support to move them. To, and I know that's how you work with your the, the physios you train, but also the patient's you work with as well. I, I, do you find that to be a pretty be decent struggle for physios to move from that? I mean, you've already alluded to it a bit and you've really explained it very nicely, but how do you help a physio, I guess, would be a good question too, to get comfortable getting to know the person before they get to know their mechanics. I think actually the, this, the new data and then the new kind of science that comes up actually speaks for itself. And it's, or it's really helping us when I say us, I mean, you and me, all the, and all the other ones who want to work like this a little bit more, but we really have some data that helps us uh, say that this is actually a more important approach than the biomechanical way. And most of all, one of the things that we can see is like the, that the pain self-efficacy is so important for the prognosis. And I don't think that we can be the fixer and then help somebody build their pain self-efficacy. I think we really need to put the person in the driving seat and not just like, in a taxi, right? They just sit in the back seat and we give them some treatment or something and they go again. We need to put them as an active participant in the treatment. And I've, I, sorry, I'm just, um, and I know that a lot of uh, people in pain and especially you know, people with uh, pain for a long time, they want to participate so much. They really want to have so much more in their control, things that they can do. What can I do? How can I help this? And, and not just go to a physio once a week, go to an osteo the other, the other Thursday, and, and they get appointments. And just like so much more is out of their control because they want things done on them. That's how the systems or the biomechanical uh, way very black and white. But what they really want is also to have this self-management uh, feeling like, I'm handling this. I got this. I know what to do. And we need to help them build that confidence. But to do that, we also need to, I, I sometimes talk about not just, if we want to help patients with a self-efficacy, we actually need to start with helping the clinician build their self-efficacy. <laughs> So how can we help them be confident in asking these questions, in getting to know the person and uh, define their role as a physio, as also a, a helper in behavioral change or uh, helping the person, not just the body. So, so there is a shift in this that makes, I need to, because a lot of the barriers for clinicians when I hear it is, I'm not a psychologist. I, I don't know how to do this. And actually I'm a little bit scared if I'm, going to open up like Pandora's box and it's just like, and I don't know how to handle it. But at the same time, I believe every physio has this very empathic and emp empathetic, is it? Empathetic. Say, help me. Empathetic. Thank you. And uh, I have this empathetic why, they, why they did, they wanted to be a physio. They really want to help the person, right? And they have then, and I'm sure that every clinician has tried that they have opened up a person and they say, and the person said, nobody's ever listened to me like this before. Or they start crying or they get touched and moved because we also touch their bodies. We touch them as a person. And, and I remember this. I remember that I had this 
ability. That's a, that's a very big word. It's not what I want to say. It's, my language is against me. But I have this natural way of people's opened up to me. And I think a lot of physio has it. That when, when, to, when they talk to people, open up. Because there are so few people that you actually can talk about their pain with. Here you have a physio who's so interested in your pain. And it's just like, okay, I can talk about it. And I can explain it. And I can... It's so, you don't do it with your friends, you don't do it with your family necessarily, but here there's a person who's really interested in your pain experience. And that's very vulnerable, actually. And that we, as a physio, feel comfortable in holding that room where it's okay to talk about this and it's okay to talk about how it's impacting you. And as a clinician, feel confident in holding that room and not just, uh, a lot of physios also talked about, well, I know how to open the knot. And then what? I don't know what to do then. I, I, how can I help them with this? Then it's just like, okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, physical is just like, they lag like the next level. So how can I use what you just opened up so beautifully? How can I help you use that and help move forward towards what you really want and feel confident in making that move and use this so important vulnerable information that you get from your client and help them use that in the change they want to make or in what behavior they want to change or things like this right or in this reconceptualizing of the problem of the pain experience right so 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 building i think it's sometimes it's really just be comfortable in learning the questions sometimes it's very practical okay you get the script, you have to learn it. Try to ask these questions, see what happens. So feel comfortable asking a question that is potentially vulnerable. And because you also need to be comfortable in doing that and not be afraid of what the answer is, right? And then when you get more and more comfortable in asking questions and receiving the answers and learning how to, how can I receive this without either going into it, just like, just, I'm sorry, hi, bye bye. But really, how can I use the answers you give me and help you use that further on your journey? Yeah. So, but that's really the skill set in it. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you that sometimes we take it like to the first steps of this approach where we can ask sometimes a difficult question, but are you ready to deal with what comes from the patient then? Are you going to be able to take that information, one, validate it and empathize with it that man, I'm so sorry this has happened to you. I'm, this really sounds like a really tough journey for you. And then being able to then construct it, like we talk about this co-constructed narrative that we put together with a patient that hopefully makes sense of their story, helps them make sense of their story. Obviously, Peter O'Sullivan and CFT approach will talk about making sense of pain. But and that's mm. what we, we do, right? We try to construct a narrative that with a patient of like, this is how I heard your story. Do you mind if we talk about it and how maybe it impacts your story might impact your pain and different things and then moving that step further of okay let's do something and keeping these things in mind because i agree like a lot of physios hear the information oh heard that but let's go talk to the things i'm comfortable about let's look at your pelvic alignment and all these things i'm wondering if you can speak to the difference what you see between what you would consider like maybe a pain treatment and a pain coaching session do you see a delineation between those two and how might they differ because i think there's maybe traditional pain treatments, and then there's pain coaching. And we'll maybe get into where you see pain coaching functioning as a role in the healthcare systems moving forward. When I talk about it, uh, a lot of people think that pain coaches is, is only chronic complex pain. Uh, and I actually don't believe that. I think that it definitely has a role all over all kinds of treatments, injuries, or uh, conditions. Because it's also like a communication skill, right? It's about the questions and it's about the communication and the relation to the person and how to make it person-centered. So it's also like this mindset. But I think the pain treatment really is like focusing on the pain and the pain coach is, coaching is focusing on the person or the human. And that is that is like micro, macro <laughs> kind of view, if we call it that. And it's, and it's not necessarily that it's one or the other. I don't think it's like a binary thing. I think it really depends on the person in front of you because sometimes you really need very focused micro. That can be helpful sometimes, right? And sometimes the best thing you could do is not at all go that in that way. Like I had a patient who has, she was getting around and she was like, I have 48 diagnosis. And I was just like, wow, okay. 
Should I make a physical examination or trying to find a 49? No, I don't think so. Maybe we need something different, right? How, and it's just like when we do the pain coaching, it's really about putting the patient in the driving seat and really make them walk beside them on their journey. And I think like a coaching, I actually, there was this World Physiotherapy Day here in September where it's about low back pain. And I, and there was a webinar with Kieran O'Sullivan and he was taught, and I asked about pain coaching because I'm asking everybody about pain coaching these days. I really believe that the pain coaching term is, is, and I think that in, in a couple of years, it's much more normal. But, and that's also when I talk to you and I really, I think that the best way to make something new is a collaboration with the ones who work with it. So I asked him, well, what do you think about pain coaching? And he was just like, well, pain coaching, the, the, it's also about more like a process based. I, I think a lot of people also talk about this process based uh, approach instead of an intervention based approach. And I think that's really the coaching style also that we not necessarily see each other three times a week or something like that. Well, we take a good time to make like good basics, a good foundation and figure out where you're going, what's standing in your way and how can I help you with that? And then we follow them maybe over a l longer time, but not necessarily as often. So we really put them and making the adjustments, making help them figure out if they come to like a rough patch or a flare up or what should we do here and really take these experiences and help them. Okay, what should you do now? How can you? So it really is this supported self-management that a lot of people talk about, right? So, so he really is like, it's about like the long run that you follow them over a longer period, but not as often as pain treatment. That's me trying to modulate your pain. Uh, if, if I make very, if I'm making very black and white, right? But, uh, but, but a good question, yeah. I want to respect your time until I've really enjoyed the conversation. And mm. with that said, I, where do you see pain coaching in the future? Like where, if we're trucking out 10 years and where you, where would you like to see pain coaching or where do you see it functioning within maybe just a greater whole of working with people in pain? Right now I'm trying to make this pain coach education in Denmark. And there's a reason why I'm making it an education and not a weekend course because I have been on so many weekend courses uh, and most of the time I'm amazed and I'm inspired. But then I gone on Monday and I was just like, how do I put this into play? How, how do I do this? So I really want to educate people to feel comfortable in the communication skills, in the asking questions and have this both the pain science as we start to talk about and also the question skills and the communication skills to help people make behavior changes. So I really want to make, for now, it's like five months, this education. We start, on, we start with like an online platform where you get all the theoretical because you really need the knowledge also, right? So, so we start with all the theoretical so you get that on your own because that's just, you just need the information. But when we start on the education, it is so practical. Uh, I'm actually quite pragmatic in my way of thinking because we need to, I'm a nerd, right? So I love the study and all this kind of nerdy kind of stuff. But what I really needed was to be confident in doing it and getting feedback and actually be seen in all my eras. The, the places I evolved the most was when I had supervision, mentoring, where I didn't know what to say and I screw up a bit and then got the feedback. Okay, what could you have done here? What could you have done here? Because most phys physios, they are in their own room and we, we, we don't have this supervision culture. And I really believe that what is really going to move you from being a clinician who really wants to work with communication, have learned a lot about communication and to actually doing it and feeling comfortable in it, you need to work with others and you need to be seen and you need to try it out and you need to feel it on your own like you have to feel how, how is it when i get this question and we need, really need to work it in a practical setting so that's very important for me that it's it has this big focus on the practical stuff and live cases and feedback and also on yeah learning to do it in real life that's uh, what i wanted to see you know definitely but if I talk about what I hope it will be in the future, I really hope it's a title in itself. I really hope, if I really like see the big mission here, you know, I actually hope that there's a pain coach 
connected to every physio clinic in, let's say, 10 years, hopefully. <laughs> that It's not like it's something that should stand instead of a physio. But I, be- I truly believe that if, if a patient comes in, I had this experience when I when I'm early in my career that I knew how to screen for psychosocial factors, but then I didn't know what to do with them. So I had, had all the questionnaires, I know how to spot it, ABC down there, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I could see it, but I didn't know how to work with it or I didn't have the time to it. So I hope that there's a pain coach in every physio clinic. So when you, there's a person coming in and you can see all the psychosocial factors that's involved in this, it's not necessary that he or she shouldn't be there, but you know what? I think it would be very good for you if, if, to give you the best treatment here. I would recommend that you have three hours with our pain coach. And then the pain coach can work with all this. What is wrong and uh, redefining the problem, work with the experience, work with how you see the pain and also work with the, uh, for instance, the psychosocial factors. Um, and, and then the physio is working for the rehabilitation, for instance. So it's more like a collaboration, right? And, and then I actually also hope that there's a pain coach in maybe, uh, well, not maybe. Actually, I hope there's a pain coach in every company. So when a person is out with a low back pain, they don't sit around for six weeks and just wait at home. But you like, it should be as normal as seeing a pain coach if you are in pain, as it is normal to see, for instance, a stress coach when we have stress. So we have this n- normal expectation of working with you as a person when you're also in pain. So maybe there's a pain coach connected to your company. So when you have low back pain, ah, oh, the company have a health insurance and you're addressed here to your pain coach and they can help you what to do, how to stay connected to the, to the work. How can we help you trans, transist, uh, transist? Back to work again. Sorry about my language. I don't good. have all the words. But how can we do that? And maybe also there's a pain coach in the system. So if you're out of job, if you're sick and you're out of job, there's a pain coach that's connected to you so you can help you through this process. That's absolutely my big goal. And I really hope that the, I, I already know that the pain coach title is used, but it's not really... I really want to set the standard for it. So it's also really like an education and not just a weekend course to be a pain coach. But it really is that and you have learned it and it's not something you just know, like a mindset or knowledge, but you actually, it's the skill set. Yeah, that's definitely the dream. I couldn't agree more with the the thoughts. I think as physios and OTs and chiropractors, osteopaths, it, there needs to be a degree of experiential learning with this. This isn't something that on a Saturday and Sunday, you're going to all of a sudden you need to have, and especially if you have a group that can help you ask these difficult questions, get uncomfortable, understand how to function in that uncomfortable state that some of the things that we hear will bring us in. That's just normal human stuff when we hear some of the tough emotional things that patients go through and some of the things in their story. But when you as a physio can get amongst a like-minded group of people, or again, beyond just a physio, and, and be able to say, here's the questions to ask. We need you to ask them here's a group that's going to support you, that's going to help you understand that, yes, you felt uncomfortable, like we all did when we asked these questions, but we want you to function with those questions and be able to just not like I used to, just like tuck tail and run from emotions and difficult feelings and anger and the things that are natural human things that people have when they're dealing with pain. So I think your program is going to be an amazing resource for folks. And those of you who are listening, we'll have it linked in the show notes so you can Mm -hmm. check it out because I do think more of these programs where it isn't going to happen on a Saturday and Sunday. I don't mind weekend courses, but I'm probably a recovering weekend course junkie where it was just like, I have to have the next course that's going to solve this thing for me. I honestly think that we don't need more of that. I mean, we have some great ones out there, don't get me wrong, but we Hmm. need to get in programs where you get supervision when you're asking these questions and having these conversations and how are you communicating? Because one, what we think we're doing and what when somebody else watches us or when we're getting supervised may not line up. I know for me, there were some eye-opening things when I had to have people listen to how I interviewed a patient and when how I had a follow-up sessions with patients. It's uncomfortable. Nobody likes to hear themselves on video or on tape. Mm-hmm. We have, uh, we've had students in the past tape themselves audio. and um, it's. But to me, man, the room for growth in those situations exponentially more than what you're going to get on a Saturday and Sunday course when you have some folks who've probably made the mistakes you're making numerous times and can help you not make those mistakes in the future. So 
Make sure you check out Matilda's program and check out some of her stuff online too. We'll link her social profiles in the show notes. I wanted to thank you for your time today, Matilda. Thank you for everything uh, you're doing. And uh, we wish you the best of luck in everything you're doing with your program. Thank you, Mark. It's been amazing to be here. And I really hope that a lot of clinicians out there feel that this is actually something you can learn. Everybody can learn it. So I really want to help clinicians make this new complex world of pain and be excited about what are you actually capable also as a human and, and in the communication skills, because people really look for these communication skills, right? So this is something everybody can learn. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, so thank you, everybody. The most rewarding care you will provide. And if this guy who was the most uh, emotions adverse person in a treatment room can get comfortable with difficult emotions, you can do it too. So definitely check out Matilda's stuff. And we'll, like I said, link it in the show notes. We'll leave it there this week. Wherever you're listening to your podcast, we'd love if you could subscribe, maybe review, share this episode. If there's some folks who are figuring out how do I start d dealing with some of these difficult conversations in my clinic and maybe position myself better as a coach versus a fixer, because the fixer is a quick path to burnout. I've been there. We've probably all been there. So enjoy the rest of your week. We will talk to you all next week.